I just rented out this like uh, office studio space and on the day I interview you, they're redoing the floor. So here I am in my basement with the old Hot Wheels sticker next to it. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a real creep. I look, I look deep into people's backgrounds and try to piece together clues as to what sort of person they are. I should have just put a bunch of like newspaper headlines back here. <laughs> It's completely missing, uh, missing children and stuff. Or even like feel good stories or like irrelevant sports headlines from seven years ago. Pretty good. Yeah, that would actually, that would have kept me occupied for sure. <laughs> I can't like, figure this guy out. It's like obscure f sports references. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, like Luke Longley, 1996. I don't know. <laughs> Kirby, Kirby Puckett, barehanded catch, 1984. What? Why? Al Albert Bell uh, brought on to the White Sox for half a season. That's like one of them. Yeah. Funny, dude. That's another podcast altogether. I'll, I'll go down that rabbit hole with you, too. Well, you're from around here, or you were like born in Connecticut. When did you come to Chicago? Uh, my family moved from the East Coast to... Lake Forest, Illinois in 1990. I was midway through junior year in high school, which is a pretty, um, you know, for a kid, that's a weird time to move. I liked it because for me, um, there were, I mean, that, if you've been to Lake Forest, it's, it's beautiful. And all the kids oh, for that, sure. all the kids that grew up with it really took it for granted. And I instead was more like, I was all into it. I was like, this place rocks. That's awesome. <laughs> it was, you know, Ivy League campus. So, um, so yeah, so Lake Forest. And then um, I ended up um, going to yeah, ISU for one year. I ended up going to, uh, and then dropping out. Um, I got rejected from Northern Illinois State University, which is hilarious. Man. I got, I got accepted into the University of Illinois school of aeronautics and okay. the, and the school of dance which is funny pending a, an audition which i never went to but um yeah and then i went to i went to the school of the art institute of chicago downtown chicago and yeah kill hannah put out our first ep in 1996 and then it's, it's stay in chicago for the next fuck um yeah 10 10 years Speaking of, ladies and gentlemen, I have, uh, for those unaware, that is Matt Devine, frontman for the legendary Chicago group Kill Hannah, and the head of music partnerships for some little company called Cameo. Perhaps you've heard of it. Um, first and foremost, um, I uh, so you know you see all these quarantine memes going up, going around, and one of them read. Uh, you are currently quarantined with the first artist you ever saw in concert. Who is it? And I got to answer, that's literally happening to me in a few days. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. How oh. long did uh, Kill Hannah, how long was that run? It was like 96 to 2014, I believe. Yeah, 90, <clears throat> 96 was the first EP. I think that's the first time, I guess, like, if you're a historian or person, you need something, some tangible evidence. There was a, there was a, yeah, an, an EP, Hummingbirds the Size of Bullets, 1996, with proper photo and proper recording and everything. Um, yeah, and then we, we, man, it's funny. I get PTSD thinking back because it was so hard for us. Do you know what I mean? Like the amount of it was, it's such a psychotic punishment <laughs> that we endured. Like just so much suffering because we built up the family and Chicago is just a ruthless place to try to make it. And right. um, in particular, you know, we were, our style was really polarizing. And there was at that time, this is even, this is before your time, but it was, you know, Chicago, the Chicago scene was like, you're either like a super, super hardcore scumbag punk rocker. Those dudes were respected. <laughs> um, or you were, um, or indie, like a real slob, sure. you know, and those guys were really respected, um, like really obscure. Now I look back, I'm like, wow, those, I'm really proud of those scenes, you know, but at the time I was like, well, and then there's industrial, which was like embarrassing, I thought, mm. at the time. And otherwise you're, you're smashing pumpkins or you're cheap trick. 
or you're or instantly you're, or you're not cool and you're not really well received so we were we went over the top glam and we had a strong image and that was you know as you know but that was i'm grateful for fans like you um who you know with whom it, it resonated but a ton of but a ton of people did not and we were we were real pariahs for a while and we just i'm thinking about back to just all the shows we played to nobody you're talking about like sure. loading gear in rehearsing all that expense all that struggle putting gear in like a tiny greg's tiny little like honda civic with like a keyboard sticking out of this window um to go play metro and to go play on a monday night at 7 p.m in this right. in a blizzard do you know what i mean it was like and but we did it and, and that with that period long answer to your question that was a period from 96 we didn't sign to atlantic records until 2003 so that's seven years of of like just a really really brutal brutal um work and and but learning and growing and figuring the shit out and getting better and getting better at writing and knowing who we are and going through personnel changes and really discovering who we what we stand for and and so that built up a lot of fan loyalty and so, so it was wild to see back then like we were even in 2000 like selling out the metro right like so 1200 1500 i don't know like kids screaming every word dressed like us and you know we did it was like mm -hmm. pandemonium you know like signing autographs for two hours and then we'd go we'd leave and go back to work the next day and our lives hadn't changed like we absolutely we don't give a fuck like greg was working at circuit city i was just telling the story the other day like greg worked at circuit city so he would get off stage in front of a sold out crowd pictures autographs the whole deal people dressed like him to meet him and giving us like dolls and action figures and art that they made and poetry and tattoos that they have and then he'd next morning get up put on like a a polo shirt that said circuit city on it with a with his badge on it and go to work and make you know minimum wage being treated like ass Right. Um, you know what I mean? Just sell like stereo equipment and stuff. It was just, it's, it's, it's. I'm telling you, I'm getting triggered just thinking about, about how awful that was. And you, uh, um, you mentioned your musical style being polarizing, and nowadays it's uh, even in the last few years, you know, it seems like you have a lot of bands that are influenced by you guys. Like the obvious one that comes to mind is like Silver Sun Pickups. How do you feel about, do you consider that a form of flattery? Do you feel like your style was like lifted with that credit? Um, what, what's your take? It's funny, the Silver Sun. Yeah, I think I like that we are part of the landscape and the conversation. That's all I cared about. Like we, right. that, cause that was, I lifted from everybody, you know? So I, and I think back to those bands that we're well, not lifted directly per se, but I, I could, I wouldn't have, I mean, my heroes were Perry Farrell, Jane's Addiction, Billy Corgan in a huge way. And absolutely. Pure and the Smiths, a lot of the Brit pop, a lot of the shoegazer stuff, like Catherine Wheel and Ride and all that stuff. So um, we, you know, yeah, it was funny in the case of, and then, you know, you pull back and you look back and, and you notice what our contribution was to the evolution of, of a specific movement in terms of like emo and stuff like that. And that was the sort of thing that we, hated at the time and, and, and almost like had to apologize for and you know just because we like flat ironed our hair like we wore eyeliner right. which we were by the way punished for in the earlier days and then suddenly we're now being considered part of someone else's movement that's doing that and anyway but I'm cool with it because again it I just didn't want to I don't want to be forgotten so so if we're excuse me so if we are um we're in we're part of that conversation and if and if we move the ball down the field for other people that's fucking rad and in the case of specifically silver sun pickups that was hilarious because they had everything i ever wanted you know they had cred they had like, like indie cred like beloved by the silver lake Taste you're like uh you're like that father who wants like your kid to have a slightly better life than you had 
Like, yeah. I, don't of, I don't think of them as my kids. I think of them as just like, they beat me. That's what I think of. It's just like, <laughs> like I, you know, but yeah, it's fun. Like you go back and a lot of people, by the time we came on their radars, we're known for a big radio song. And they don't understand that our first, our, our beginnings were all shoegazer, you know, sure. and, and a lot of stuff that's even relevant now. So I was always hitting my head against the wall when we were misinterpreted or I, I, I just thought it was total, I just thought it was unjust that the, the peeps who are like the gatekeepers for cool who are say like the K-Rock DJ or the, you know, whoever the writing the press for or the you know, Pitchfork and, and all that stuff. I'm like, God, they have no idea like how cool I am. I'm like, I'm cooler than all these people. <laughs> if you're meeting me right now, you're seeing the um, corporatization of Kilana, you know, and, um, but you don't, you don't know about the three, you know, self-released EPs that were like pure kind of like, noise scapes and just layers and layers of, of, of textured totally non-commercial um, indie tracks and then yeah so I heard so, so when I heard, heard him singing in a voice that's like mine I'm like yeah that's it was more it didn't bother me so much as it was everyone calling me like yo this yeah. dude I thought you were on the radio and it's so or some pickups I'm like oh that's cool and then and then but then yeah there were some crossover where like then our crew worked for them and I'm like all right there's gotta be that's something. a little I think there's some connection but I, I can't say for sure for sure for sure <laughs> um you know you mentioned a uh, corporatization of music you are now working a uh, corporate job over at Cameo you're the head of music partnerships knowing what you know now coming up as a musician how do you approach it approach that corporate job with that knowledge it's so funny you ask that. I, I approach it as a musician. I approach, I approach my role. I, I say this. I approach like the destiny of the company, the same way I pr approach the destiny of my band. In a sense, like it's an all-or-nothing struggle. What we are doing, I really believe in, and you know, it's us against the world. Uh, no one sees the work that you do. They only, you know, they see what, maybe the byproduct of it. But, you know, similarly, uh, you know, two years ago when I started, my conversations trying to convince, or like really just my kind of crusade on behalf of, of Cameo to other musicians or to any sort of like influencer or content creator in general. It was me selling them on something that I, I already was so bought in on, and I and it wasn't an easy sell. And and there were there were people who uh, I don't know why my tone today is kind of bitter, <laughs> like, but uh, no, it was it was it was the same thing. Like doors were shut in your face. You know, it was like the early days of the band. Right. And and you you know I never doubted the you know what we what we really what sort of value we have and how you know what we do and, and why and the, I guess the importance or the significance or the relevance of what, of what we do but it's it's very you know it's a it's a climate it's a culture of rejection and, and I remember being in South by Southwest and talking about people like couldn't care less I remember being right. at, um, at a you know in Salt Lake City or um, you know a Sundance talking to A-list celebrities and they could care less. This was just a year ago, you know what I mean? So so it's really it's, it's really awesome and well-deserved and, and hard, hard earned of where we are right now. So, and then, so that's how I approach the, the destiny and, and my kind of fight for what, what we're trying to accomplish here. In terms of my, my, my just day-to-day, -day, I approach it like a band member as well because I, I know firsthand how important fans are. I know how you have that, hard you have that basic empathy. Yeah, and, and also how hard it is to survive, you know? Like like there are there's so many artists that so so there's the Snoop Dogs and the Akons of the world who make a ton of money and on Cameo, which is rad and I'm yeah. incredibly proud of that. But there's there's a really there's a tier beneath that of artists who 
have put the work into build. So they've already done the hardest part. They they have those fan bases. They they have that body of work. They have, they they have all these achievements. But there, until now, there isn't really a, a good way for them to monetize, and the mm. business itself is fucked. So, you know, you look at what what crumbs they make from streams. You make you look at how many hands are out before the, you know what they earn reaches their bank sure. account. You know? So, so I get to think like an adult musician in a world with a broken music industry, and I think about. The like wives and families, and I think about the responsibilities and what it means to adult up as a musician. And I know how important financial security is and just survival in general. And so I, that's how I approach it. I, I look at it like if if the lead singer of a of a band of a warp tour homie band friend of mine can make an extra 10k a month. Um, by doing, by just showing his fans how much he loves them, and and creating magic with them, then it's just win, 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 win. You know, not even factoring in what what people are doing to raise money for charity and all that. So it's sure. real higher purpose, real positive, all around comprehensively positive uh, project to be a part of. You know, um, I've bought a, cu- a few cameos in my lifetime for various like different purposes. The last one I'll tell you is uh, I purchased a cameo from Santa Claus. Oh yeah. Because um, my yeah. five-year-old daughter has uh, been experiencing the cabin fever with you know everything going on, and uh, yeah, her oh, bit, you of, it, bit of an attitude problem. You bought her Santa Claus in May. Oh yeah, because Santa Claus told her, I watched the video recently, or because it came in yesterday, that Santa is still watching even if it's the middle of the year and there's still time to, for Christmas. All of it's taken into account. Well, that is true. You know, he is watching. That's, he doesn't just start watching. It. Oh yeah. He's watching now. Yeah, yeah scare the fear of God into her. <laughs> and it's because of you, Matt. It's because of you.